But then there was a challenge that came from MIT and, and University of California, Santa Barbara. They said, well, we're looking at experiments in this area. And what we see is that there are three reports in the literature where they, pred they predict based on theory that the binding could not have been as fast as, w as what was being measured, meaning there were too many steps coming too fast based on the concentration in solution. So, and, they, and, they, and they're smart enough to say such discrepancies suggest that an additional as yet undetermined ingredient, see, must be present in the experiments. So, David happened to stop into my office, that same David King, and I said, go into the lab and see if you can see the scattering from the virus. Look directly down on the microcavity inside the cell and see if you can see the scattering. About an hour later, he ran back into my office and he said, they're in orbit. I said, really? They're in orbit, he says. And I said, well, when you double the amount of light, do they go faster in orbit? He said, yes. So I said, you mean to say they're drawn in and they're in orbit? He said, yes, there's David. And, and I said, but you're only operating with 30 microwatts of light. That's, that's like a 30th of what's coming out of this. You know, radiation pressure, the whole idea of tractor beams, like from Star Trek or something, being able to draw things in with 30 microwatts of light, sounded impossible. Not only that, but before these particles got into the beam, the, the, the wavelength was constant and then began to chatter as it came in there. So he was looking directly down from the top. This is what he saw. And I'll, I'll just show you a video of essentially what it looked like. looking directly down on the top of this thing and you can see we're not resolving this but it's scattering from some object which is going to the other edge going down below coming around coming up the other edge going around again going down this edge coming around again he had created an orbital system in solution, or at least he discovered it. And it was it sort of boggled the mind. I mean, uh, microfluidics had always been the case where, in fact, if light was used, it was to illuminate things it wasn't being used for the force that it could produce. So all of fluidics was changed at that point when we published this and now then papers were coming out from everywhere right after that. He had created light force fluidics, a new area, and uh, more importantly it generated another three patents on all kinds of things. I can't go into all of them but uh, but it was a very exciting time uh, when we saw that. It, it, in Star Trek, I always remember, the spaceship could draw things in by using a tractor beam. We had created a tractor beam. So you may wonder, what was it composed of? So here's this light, which coming through a fiber that's stimulating this spherical mode and several things are happening. First, there's a force called a gradient force. Light, uh, particles like to be where the intensity is highest. So they tend to move toward that surface. That's called the gradient force. I won't go through the mathematical details. This, it, on silica, there's a charge on the surface because at neutral pH, it's deprotonated. So instead of having SiOH, you have SiO minus. So it's, it's negatively charged. And virus are negatively charged. So there's, 
a constant repulsion. So repulsion here, attraction from the light. And finally, there's a photon momentum flux moving around because this is a traveling wave. As it moves around, the evanescent field travels with it. And so this is the kind of thing that was happening. Well, they, that's an illustration. That's actual data. I mean, we just kind of synchronized the two. Okay. The ability for an antigen to bind to an antibody is now enhanced. Why? Because we've created dimensional reduction. We have made a railroad track, okay? A railroad track that leads to an antibody. Watch. At least as an illustration, this thing gets caught by that trap, starts to move around in order to find that particular antibody. It can find it much faster that way than random diffusion. Or if it's starting out up here, and I'm just showing it now looking from the side, it's going to move around until it gets into that track and then find that antibody much more quickly. Or if you wanted to, you could invent a symbol. I picked something close to a field effect transistor, th this symbol. Light comes in to this symbol. The symbol is that, <laughs> which enables this virus to move down to the antibody, right? And now you can think of ways in which you can make circuits of these symbols, right? Therefore, circuits of resonators. This is also a way to do fabrication. Suppose, for instance, you wanted to put something on the surface and you don't have the fabrication tools or you want to do it in a microfluidic cell, right? then how would you do it? The answer is use light forces. We call that light force assembly and we also issued a, a patent application on that. This is the person who discovered a way to enhance signals well beyond anything we could imagine, right? This is Sika Shapova. She imagined using a gold nanoparticle and its plasmonic properties so that when it's put onto the microcavity, the field is further enhanced where it's put on by the circulating wave. Here's what her data looked like. This was the greatest signal we could ever get from a distribution of particles of the size which is being represented here, a size of dielectric particles. She put this plasmonic particle on and she suddenly noticed that there are all these that we couldn't explain. They were due to an enhancement due to the plasmonic particle. So that in addition to the small steps, we could get gigantic steps. It was only a factor of two or three from the edge of this to the largest thing you get here. But in fact, it was a harbinger of things to come. The idea of adding nano optics to micro optics to, inf to create a much bigger signal and to see things we couldn't see before. So here, you plant this plasmonic particle in the form of something like a sphere. When light comes around and drives it into resonance, it creates a big field on the top and the bottom of this thing. And with this, we manage to detect. This is when we put that system in, we could see that plasmonic particle on the surface. And then suddenly, where we couldn't possibly see MS2 before because it was too small, much too small, as a matter of fact, our, our noise was on the order of five femtometers, and MS2 would have generated on a bare cavity a quarter of a femtometer. We would never have been able to see it, but yet, there they are. They appeared. The plasmonic particle created a receptor, which was an amplifier. And it was nanoscopic. The enhancement turned out to be 70 times. So no longer four times, now up to 70. You can just count them. This is taking a derivative of that binding curve and you can see every one of the viruses as they come in. And then over here, 
There is no virus injected. Cancer markers can also be detected one at a time. When you have thyroid cancer, they cut your thyroid out. Okay, that's what they do. Supposedly, they've cut the entire cancer out. Ah, but there's a protein generated by the thyroid. So after two weeks or so, they begin looking to see if the protein is there. If it is, there are remnants of it in your system. The cancer's still there, right? Now imagine being able to see those protein one molecule at a time. One thyroglobulin protein at a time. So here, uh, the maximum signal would have been one hundredth of what we could possibly detect before. But because of the plasmonic particle, we began to see steps. You can see them there. Okay, from that plasmonic particle known as a nanoshell. Now we were up to 266 times. The reason we got so much higher, we didn't quite understand. I mean, after all, we didn't expect to get so much higher. We, our theory was saying that we shouldn't get this kind of thing. What we hadn't realized is that these shells are not perfect on their surface. They're bumpy. When plasmonic particles are bumpy, they create hot spots that are very close to the surface. So they would react to very small molecules more sensitively than they react to a, a virus, which is considerably larger. So that's the reason we managed to see them. The bumps were only 4 nanometers to 10 nanometers in size. And this is what they do when you do a calculation it shows that as you get close to the surface, you get this big enhancement of potential signal over what you would have had before, just due to a bump. Another fortunate thing, we published this in 2013. Uh, it's been taking off in the literature. And we're down to well below where I ever expected we would be, we're down to a sensitivity of eight zeptograms. Okay, remember what I said when I started this. The protein on the surface, the epitopes, single protein, have a mass of something on the order of 30 kilodalton, something like that. That is 10 or 20 times higher than this. Our sensitivity now here, 8 zeptograms. Oh, so you want to know what that is, and you know, you go, atograms is 10 to the minus 18. Zeptograms, 10 to the minus 21 grams. We need more landing pads. So at the University of Michigan and also at Abu Dhabi, they're making rings based on these designs where they're enhancing signals by essentially putting plasmonic particles on the rings. Okay, um, this you'll hear more about uh, soon as the people at Abu Dhabi begin to finish, also at the University of Michigan. So one of the thank nature methods for publishing our, our technique. An industry has come about, a, a company by the name of Genolite has created rings after rings after rings, a multiplexed type se sensor that can sense a whole slew of different interactions. And David Kang has created something called MP3 Laser. You remember the name of our laboratory, MP3 Lab? Uh, and uh, we have one of these in our lab, and it's fantastic. I mean, I don't know how he did all of this. I mean, it was a, he, he made it like an iPhone. So when you, t when you call him and you say, look, we'd like to do this experiment, but in fact, your system doesn't do it, he sends us an app. <laughs> we load it into this system, and it does that new experiment. Uh, it's fantastic. So we'd like to thank uh, people at Rockefeller University who's helped us near the beginning. Um, David Kang, I highlight here. 
Uh, Frank Vollmer was a grad student there. He was a biochemist who wanted to learn physics, so I mentored him. Um, Stephen Holler uh, contributed. He was one of our students. Interesting guy. Uh, he created a company, a sensor company, and sold it for $26 million in his 30s. So he did all right. And then all of these people are people at the Polytechnic who contributed to the work. You can vis visit us on YouTube. This is a short, I'm never sure whether web pages will change their names here, so instead, <laughs> a place in Texas runs this page. It's mp3l.org, and you can vi visit our YouTube at which is MP3L WGM, so MP3L for Microparticle Photophysics Lab and WGM for Whispering Gallery Mode. And that's it. <laughs> so do you have any questions or anything? You should be assured of the fact that I'm dumb as a rock. So go ahead. So you can ask any question. What you got? So the gold net part, part would it be able to uh, also start orbiting and would that yes. increase? Yes, yes it can. In fact, that's how we put it on the surface. Okay. We put it on the surface by, by drawing it in from an orbit mm -hmm. with a little pulse of, of intensity so we could get it close enough to stick. Yeah. That's a very good question. Yes. Um, yeah. Companies are developing. Yes. Uh, Genolite. Yeah, so what are those rings actually? Okay, so uh, um, there's silicon, which is very high refractive index on silica. Silicon on silica. So silica has a refractive index of about 1.45, but silicon is, is way over 2. So the light is confined within the silicon ring. And then, of course, there's evanescent fields around the ring. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Yes? Uh, about the microfluidic feed, uh, of microfluidic that can be, um, does the, because it's like too small, so the physical feature will be like changed? Of so the, the orbit, like. oh, the orbit? Yeah. You mean about light force fluidics, mm -hmm. this new subject? Yeah. Uh, so Change. I'm not quite getting it, but uh, the gold particle will be grabbed on to by the tractor beam, the light force, and be drawn to the surface. If there's a repulsion between the surface, as there was in the case of these negative particles and the negative surface, then it can remain out there and, and, and orbit. A bump in. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, the normal sensitivity of of the bare cavity was not sufficient to see a single molecule. Mm -hmm. But when you put a plasmonic particle on, it has this property that at a particular frequency, and it's pretty broad frequency spectrum, uh, there's a a large field created on the north and south pole of this nanoscopic thing, okay? So that if you're sending a particular field in, you get a much larger field, and therefore that, remember that principle that I had, which the sensing principle said that the amount to which you polarize, the energy that polarizes the particle, is the wavelength shift of the photons and the mode. So if you have a higher field, you polarize it more strongly. I hope that helps. Yeah. Any th yes? Is this biosensor available in market for any Sorry, I'm sorry. Is this biosensor available in market for any medication? Yes, uh, from Genolite. Right, it is. Yeah. They're, they're putting it into hospitals. Yeah. Yes? Uh, are there any other kinds of different gold nanostructures that you use? 
Yeah, some people use uh, nano rods, uh, which are you know rod shaped. Some people use nano shells, which are gold on the outside and they have glass on the inside. Uh, and some people use just solid gold. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you said in the initial part that the initial ones couldn't detect the MS2. So after increasing the sensitivity, now can it helps in detecting the MS2, does it? Yes. Apparently, just recently, single atomic ions were detected inside of the fluid, right? Not by our group, but by a group in Germany. So yeah, it, it enhances the sensitivity tremendously. So that used gold nanorods, yeah. Is it possible to distinguish between which virus Say if there's a mixture of viruses in the fluid, is it possible to distinguish which one binds? Yes, yes. So, so it turns out what you do is you put specific antibodies on the surface. Now you can generate the antibodies by essentially uh, poisoning bacteria with the, with the virus and then harvesting the antibodies and then binding those to the surface. Well, I, I meant at the same time. Could it, is it only for one specific No, no. Uh, to, you should be able to distinguish different things um, if you can if you can identify the spatial regions where you put those those antibodies. Yes, that's another subject. Yeah, right. So Well, I mean, the micro cavities are, are dielectric. They're, they're glass. Yeah. Because the metals have too much loss, so you don't want to make a solid micro uh, cavity out of metal. It's, it's fine if you just use nanoscopic metal particles. Na nanoscopic. nanoscopic, meaning uh, uh, nanometers in size. But the micro cavities we were using were typically 40 micrometers. Okay, so they are, uh, they are a thousand times the size of those little uh, gold nanoparticles that are put on the surface. Okay. So the nanoparticles act, act as receptors. So if you then put antibodies on the nanoparticles that are specific to a certain virus, then the signal gets enhanced when the virus reaches that plasmonic particle, the little particle, the nanoscopic particle, which is on the microcavity. So like, um, what if I use um, a soft particle, like the hydrogen bees or rose bees or cavities? Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with, with soft materials for the microcavity is that uh, they will tend to, because their elastic coefficients are not very stiff, they will tend to fluctuate on their surface. That will broaden these resonance lines, okay? And so not as useful, but we've made them out of PDMS, which is soft, and they're pretty good, yeah. Okay, so um, the other question is, um, uh, we know the, uh, when we rotate the, the bees, um, the antigen also, like, uh, oscillating up around the surface. So we know that, what if we have the polymer polymerized particle, and then the antigen could like uh, uh, physically absorb it on the particle, on the bee, or the protein. Yes. So uh, we, like, we enhance the signal, but at the same time, we enhance the ability, the physical absorbance of the mm -hmm. to the bees. How do we avoid this? How do we? Avoid this. Avoid it. Ah, uh, okay, so. I mean, typically what you do in these, these systems is you try to block all parts of the surface. You block it chemically, except for the places where you want the receptors to be. You don't want non-specific adsorption. Okay, so you have a problem, you know, I mean, if you, if you have a well-designed um, well surface, okay, so surface science comes into this, then you can block all of the parts of the surface except of where, you, where you've put your receptors. Okay. 
Any others? Uh, okay, so what I'm seeing here, aside from this guy, who's, who's ready now, uh, the guys are being beaten here, all these girls, who, they, they're asking all kinds of questions, yeah. Um, once again, if, uh, unless you have a way of, um, the, the, rate will, the rate will be conditioned by the on compared to off time. So th remember, most of these antibodies physically bind, right, the, the antigen to the antibody. So there's a certain time over which they'll remain there before they come off. There are some things that bind very nicely, like, Streptavidin and biotin, right? Things like that, very strong. But a lot of things, uh, you know, basically have an on to off rate. So the answer is, yeah, uh, the reason why people would want a thing like this is because they want to test antibodies and see which ones that are most effective. The ones that are most effective would have an on rate much greater than their off rate. So you've hit on a very important purpose of this overall thing to test basically the quality of antibodies for particular antigens. Does that help? Okay. Any, any other uh, questions? Guys, come on. I mean, you guys, look, I don't know about this. I mean, usually, the, yeah, go ahead. Um, so you would want to put the antibodies on the equator just because that's where the flow of the antigen would be? Well, that's where the light is moving, right? Uh, at least in what I what I demonstrated, right? It is possible by using different frequencies to move the light to different places. Mm -hmm. But no, if it, if it, it, the neat thing about this is that what we call that carousel trap, we call it that because it's like a carousel, right? Uh, it, it can draw things to the surface and then they stick at a particular latitude, right? So thinking about the Earth as having an equator, a North Pole, South Pole, the only difference between our micro world and that is that our micro world is only 80 millionths of a meter across and the Earth is 8,000 miles across. But aside from that, the geometry is the same, right? So, yeah, so what you'd, what you'd want to do is um, pull the particle to precisely where the light is and that's exactly what this carousel trap does. It's very fortunate. Uh, I hope that helped. Okay. Any any other questions, guys? What what's happening here? Uh, no, uh, no. Ah, 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 a okay, guy. Okay. How do you solve the impurity of the sample? How do you solve the impurity of the sample? Like you want to test the viruses, right? Like yes. So you want to test the blood. Yes. Well. Okay, let me, let me um, since that's a very hard question to answer, right? And I, I recognize that, but I wanted to point out something. Inside of your system right now, right now, okay? And I, my friend here can tell us just how many interactions are occurring per second with the DNA, right? And there are a lot of impurities in there, right? And, it, and, and the, you can recognize the right protein based on receptors which are in the biological system. So you're depending really on this idea of using biology to create the stickiness of that surface that's specific to particular antigen, okay? And, and it's pretty selective. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, right? Think about that, right? It's a wonderful question, but in, in, in practice, I think, Steve, can I ask you two I never heard of a, I never heard of a crap protein. No. no. Right, so, I mean, <laughs> that's a new... Do you know, do you know the word crap? Uh, <laughs> anyway. Who's on uh, first? Uh, the first, is, the first question is this. Uh, can you go through why the thing is called... Uh, 
Uh huh. Yes. 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 I can. I can do that. But I had not done that. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna take us all away from from London to Be to Beijing. <laughs> uh, not gonna take too long. Okay. So if you if you go to London and you go up into St. Paul's Cathedral and it's about one level up, there is a gallery which is completely round. It has sort of concave walls a bit. And if you whisper into the corner, uh, then you can be heard 40 meters away on the other side by a person standing there putting his ear toward the surface. Because what happens is the acoustic wave comes around. So obviously this is not acoustic, right? But it seemed like the right title for it because it was already a phenomenon that people knew. They called it a whispering gallery. Now, I'm going to take you to Beijing. In Beijing, there's a place called the Temple of Heaven. Okay, guys, tell us about the Temple of Heaven. What do they have there? Just like London, yeah. but much, much larger. Everything is larger in China. <laughs> okay, much, much larger, right? And people stand at the wall and they whisper to each other. I think it's more than 70 meters or more across. I mean, it's really incredible. I'm sorry, I should have put a slide in on that. And, uh, can we get back from China to Grand Central so we can go and experience? Right, but Grand Central is not a complete. Okay, so what happened in Grand Central, I think, now I'm interpreting this, is that Vanderbilt, so man, a wealthy man, gave the property of, to the people to build Grand Central. But he demanded only one thing, that in the basement of Grand Central there'd be an oyster bar where he could have his oysters. Okay. The ceiling of the oyster bar was like this. Okay. The story is, whether I don't, I don't know if it's entirely true, that he would sit his competitors at one side and he would sit himself on the other because he remained quiet. <laughs> and that's called a whispering gallery, but it's, it's uh, you might call it semicircular, right? So not resonant in the same way it was. Yeah. In fact, just before you get into the whispering bar, there's kind of a little... Just on the outside. Yeah, a little enclosure outside, which right. is what shaped like some book right. and you, every time you go away you'll see people whispering on, on one side of the wall and listening to that. It's much smaller of course, I guess about that, 20, 20 foot across. But you can go and try it, that actually works. But the principle still is talking about a wave going around the, the sphere, right. right? Well, in this case around a yeah. hemispherical top. Anyway, that was the first question. <laughs> Did I say a hand? Guys, you're still being beat here. Uh, and uh, my, my second while we're thinking is, uh, can you go through again uh, why the resonance, a resonant peak is generated mm. in, in, the, in the sphere? So that I can ask I mean, why it's inverted? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah what, what, what you are seeing, essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's because as the light, uh, one way to think of it is as the light it does, um, uh, generates the resonance, the, lo the energy goes into the sphere and not into the rest of the fiber. That's one way to think of it. Yes, yeah, so essentially, I mean, mm -hmm. what we're seeing is that once you get into We see a dip, small, right? We have a, again, the sphere steals energy from what goes through the fiber, and hence you get, yeah. get a signal. Right? Does, does it make sense? Very similar to what we talked about last time. Okay, well, I want to, uh, I can see it's been very participatory, <laughs> and I thank you for that. Um, and uh, let's, a uh, little hand for our <laughs> professor. <laughs> okay, and um, Thanks so much, Steve. Some, sometime in the future. <laughs>